Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country, God is good all the time and I'm here for another this and that video and if you're new to our channel all this is is just basically a semi-weekly vlog that I do usually pretty much bi-monthly about some of the projects that are going on, new experiments I'm trying, updates on experiments I started maybe from a last this and that video to tell you about videos I have coming out and to lead you back to some videos I may already have out that are instructional videos specifically on how to do some of the various things I'm going to be talking about today. So one of the things, <laughs> isn't this little guy cute? So this is one of my New England pie pumpkins that I grew this year. And I have found that the that this pumpkin as well as the luxury pie pumpkin grows best for us so even in our very cold summer that we had this year i still managed to get a total of six of the pie pumpkins this one here is the smallest this one here is the biggest now this is your going to be your standard size for a pie pumpkin so if you're new to growing pie pumpkins a lot of times we think of pumpkins as always being at least this big or bigger but when it comes to pie pumpkins you want to go with the smaller size so if you're thinking of planting some for next year look specifically for pie pumpkins and they're smaller and i like that because it makes them so much easier to deal with and they're cute and make really good decor for the fall until you're ready to actually turn them into a pie or put them up that's the great thing about pumpkins is that as long as you keep them in a cooler room they will last for months just like that without you having to do anything with them there's quite a few squash out there like that spaghetti squash is another one that holds up quite well butternut and many others anyway i'm really partial to pie pumpkins so what i do is i don't actually bother preserving the pumpkin until after uh thanksgiving and then i'll put them up so you're probably wondering what do you do for your pumpkin pies for thanksgiving and your pumpkin cookies and your pumpkin bread and your pumpkin smoothies and whatever it is else it is you're making well that is when I depend on the pumpkin that I preserved from the year or years before. I actually still have pumpkin put up in my freezer from 2015 because I grew so much that year, but I still kept growing them. So I still kept putting some up, but that was the biggest year for a pumpkin harvest. This was an accident. When you do harvest your pumpkins, try to make sure you leave the stem on. That's going to help them last longer in storage and uh, so this will be the first one i i'm working through when it comes time but by then it will be fully orange yes i prefer to leave my pumpkins out there as long as i can but when we start getting the heavy rains which have come i have to start bringing the stuff in because it just rains so heavy and so hard that the things that get left out can actually rot right on the vine and so even when they're still green i bring them in but by thanksgiving this will be fully orange for sure so some people might think that once if you pick it green it will stay that color well it's not true i've picked lots of squash early before it was fully the color it should be and then within a month or two it fully ripened and it gets that nice orange color that you like to see on your pumpkins or whatever color the squash is that you harvested so yes you can can pumpkin but if you're going to can it do like I did with those sweet potatoes, and I'll show you a picture right here, is make sure that you cut them up, and I recommend canning it raw, can in chunks, rather than canning as a puree, because it's just recommended you don't do that because of the viscosity of it, so thick that it could prevent the heat from getting fully to the center and killing off any bacteria and stuff that you want to keep killed off inside your jars for long-term storage. So it's best if you cut it up if you're going to can it. But if you're going to freeze it, then yes, go ahead. What I like to do is I the easiest way I found is just cut the thing in half, scoop out the seeds and do whatever it is you're going to do. Save them for next year's garden. Roast them up for eating, How whatever it is you want to do with them. And don't worry about getting all, if you're going to eat them right away, don't worry about getting all the little pumpkin pieces off of there. Those are good for you too. Just leave them on there and it adds more flavor. That's what I do when I'm going to roast up the pumpkin seeds. But then, you know, just scoop the seeds out and then place the halves 
face down into a pan and that time of year I'm baking on top of the wood stove I add a little bit of water just to keep it from drying out you can also do it face up if you want but it will fill up with moisture just it doesn't matter that but then that way when it's done baking and I I don't know the length of time sorry I can't tell you I I don't know I just check it throughout the day but once it's soft enough just scrape all the stuff out of the skin that is the easiest way to do it then rather than trying to skin it and cut it up and then you can just mash it up puree it however you want if you're using food saver in a food saver bag which is the way I used to do it then I would put it I would seal it up into the food saver bags and then stack them flat and let them freeze like that and then that makes it you can stand them up once they're frozen you can stand them straight up like this in a door or what, however you want to store them in the freezer once they're frozen solid and they're nice and flat that's one thing I do kind of miss about using the food saver and the food saver bags but last year what I did is I switched to saving my pumpkin into jars and so I will go ahead and link down below how if you're going to do something like pumpkin or any kind of liquid there's some special steps you want to follow when you're talking about freezing in jars and I will link to that video I did last year right down below so you can see my tips on how to do that so that your jars do not break so yeah that's what I do I just like to freeze it rather than worrying about canning it because it's the quickest easiest method to deal with but I do certainly understand the idea of freezer space being precious or worrying about power outages and what's going to happen to stuff in the freezer now for us power outages happen frequently around here and quite a few people in our area have a generator on hand because we're that's just what happens around here but there's things you can do to help also if your freezer is packed full that's going to help the stuff in the freezer stay frozen for a lot longer it's just you know it just everything keeps each other cold and then throwing some quilts over your freezers when the power goes out those are some things you can do to extend it until the power comes back on but if it's some it's going to be extended much longer than that then it's recommended you have some kind of backup power or you immediately get to canning some stuff or dehydrating it you can dehydrate your pumpkin puree too a lot of people like to do that and then use that pumpkin powder for doing various types of things with I haven't tried it yet I keep saying I'm going to I just haven't done it yet one of these days I will but it would be great for flavoring smoothies breads and all kinds of stuff uh, pancakes that would be so good in pancakes in the winter time our solar power is what becomes our backup when we use lose our public power and then in the summertime our public power becomes our backup if we have a lot of dark stormy days and we've used a lot of the power out of our battery bank this does st happen sometimes this summer not very often but then in that case it's the public power that becomes our backup which we actually needed quite a bit this last summer because we had a very dark summer and we were trying to balance out how much of the solar power we could use without fully draining our batteries and so and we ended up having to fall back onto our public power far more than we ever have since we had our solar systems put into place. I do, I have to say, I really like having the best of both worlds, but I also know that we can survive without it if we absolutely had to, even in a long-term situation because we also have other ways of coming up with ideas to do things without power whatsoever be it you know without needing the gas generator the solar power or the public power so finding all the many ways that you can do stuff without having to rely on any of that is also a very wise thing to look at so let's move on to some other topics and that is right here I have a, my jar of I only did one jar this year of elder flowers and decided to go ahead and let the rest go to bury you know what I've decided is that's the last year I'm gonna do that in fact I don't even know if I'll ever let any of my elder flowers go to fruit because here's the problem I had especially this year everything was much later everything because of our very cold season and then we had some storms come in earlier than they normally would for us and yes our power got knocked out we lost so many of them in the storm they all just laying all over the ground but if I harvest the flowers I can get a lot more out of the flowers than I can uh, out of the berries and so the flowers what a lot of people may not know 
do have a lot of medicinal properties very similar to the berries that are good for coughs, colds, and flus. And so I'm going to be using elderflowers for making my elderberry syrup. Now I do have elderberries from uh, the past few years that we've been growing them. And then I even have some from 2015, some organic ones still steal, sealed up tight in a jar from 2015 and these were the frontier ones that I bought back then and I was buying quite a bit because I didn't know how long it was going to take for my elderberry plants to actually start putting out fruit so I'll still be working with these and I'll be using both actually in my syrup and I will be doing a new video on that when I do that elderberry syrup because I like to change my recipe up a little bit all the time and my recipe is a little bit different different than somebody else's recipe because of the types of other things I like to add to my syrup and with that topic in mind now that we're getting into the cooler weather and we're starting to, we're going to start seeing an increase of more colds and flus and viruses and so on and so forth one thing that we started doing is usually like one night we'll have a peppermint tea for my dried peppermint because our peppermint's done out in the garden and then the next night I'll usually make up a pot of a spice tea and one of the things I started adding last year and I love it is the star anise and then um or star anise sorry uh whatever I always want to say anise anyways the star anise this is what's actually used for flavoring licorice rather than the licorice plant itself because the star anise has far more licorice flavor and scent and oh my goodness it's so good and it's so healthy for you and one of the properties especially for this time of year about the star anise that is really important to know it's one that's at the top of the list for being an excellent antiviral in fact it is used in making the in the making of tamiflu and so not only is it delicious and just has a wonderful aroma it and makes a very tasty tea especially when you're looking at this time of the year this is a, a great way to help prevent viruses or to even help your body cure itself of, of a viral infection when it has it so consider getting yourself if you're not able to grow it consider stocking up on some star anise this is the organic frontier brand i will go ahead and link to it down below i like to buy in bulk from amazon i did a video on antivirals that i will link to down below and in that video i also showed how i made a pot of tea using the star anise some cinnamon sticks and some other herbs for making a nice powerful antiviral tea so you might be interested in checking that out and just learning more about your various antivirals and things you might want to consider growing for next year or stocking up on to have in your herbal medicinal pantry and now like, I go back and forth on nut milks I love making my own homemade nut milks even though I'm not vegan I've been vegan a few different times in my life and and for the long run it's never been a healthy diet for me but I do still like certain vegan related things with my experience of being a vegan I've in the past I learned how to do a lot of things and taught myself and one of the things is making my own nut milks because the ones that you can make at home are a lot healthier and so much cheaper to do it that way because I mean we know nuts are expensive to begin with but you can get so much more out of it out of your nuts if you can make the milk and then make yourself some flour out of the pulp I have lots of videos on how to make uh, different dairy-free milks as well as uh, your own white sauce for fettuccine or even a vegan cheese I'll go ahead and put that whole playlist down below and I have an, another video coming out soon on making almond milk the first half of the video is the instructional part about making the almond milk and the other half I talk about other variations and and how to use them and so be watching for that video when it comes out so one of the things I tried most recently was doing Brazil nut, almond, and hazelnut. And that turned out to be a pretty good blend. Now I've tried blending all of those with pecan and something else. And it was okay, but I would say it was probably my least favorite. Well, my very least favorites when I've been trying different milks was the pumpkin seed milk. I thought that one would taste really good, and no, I didn't care for it. That was something I ended up using in more of a savory dish for making gravy rather than something that I'd want to put on cereal or add to my coffee. And then the other one I personally didn't care for as much was the hemp seed milk. 
but some people really like it and I do have a video on that too. And you can find it in that playlist. So anyway, sometimes I enjoy my coffee in the morning totally black and sometimes I like it with a little bit of nut milk. I never like sweetener in my coffee, but I really like the nut milks in there and the and the blend that I just did was really good. But I think the next one I'm gonna do is just gonna be plain pecan because that's another one of my favorites. Uh, just depends on the mood I'm in. But anyway, so uh, I'm not gonna start it today because it'll be too soon. I've got enough of the blend, the last blend I made in the refrigerator to last me for a couple more days. So uh, I'll probably wait till tomorrow to get the nuts soak in. When you're making your nut milks and stuff, you always wanna make sure you stay a day ahead because you want to let them soak for at least 24 hours. Oh yes, and there's also coconut milk. And you know, just consider being creative and try some of your own blends and see what you like best. You can even make smaller amounts at a time so that uh, if you find out you don't really care for it, like I didn't care for the hemp seed or the pumpkin seed milk, uh, then you're not dedicated to have to try to drink all that and not or let it go to waste But again, if it's not something you would prefer in coffee or on your cereal Then it, it's something that can be used usually those ones work really well in making more of a savory type gravy And then you can see back here. I'm not going to move it out any farther But I started another batch of mead and I guess I have a video on mead making I have a whole series on wine making but I do have a video that's dedicated just to mead making It's just one video and so this one here is actually a blueberry mead. And I made this one from the freeze-dried blueberries we got from Deep South Homestead uh, last summer, uh, summer of 2019, when we did the carousel package that we started here and we sent out to various other YouTube channels around the US and then it came back to us. One of the things that was in there were some freeze-dried blueberries grown at Deep South Homestead and they had berry over at Empty Hammock freeze dry them up for them and so we got those and they're really good and I decided to use some of them to make to get some blueberry mead started up. Now a lot of you guys know that I don't drink but I do really enjoy making wine and mead. I use wine a lot when I'm cooking. I use it for making extracts whether it be medicinal or flavored extracts and I also use it for a source of barter so we have a lot of local fishermen whether it be deep sea fishing or river fishing and so there's always somebody around here that has fish that they're willing to barter with and so even though Pat does like to go fishing and he does usually when he does that he goes to, down to California to go fishing with his dad but when he's here he rarely has time to go fishing around our own area so then I can make the the wine or the mead and then I can barter with the local fisher for some uh, salmon or steelhead or even halibut and cod. So even if you don't drink, learning how to make wine and mead is really has so many other purposes. If all you do is barter with it, that's always a great option. And I have a huge bucket of honey that a lot of times honey, it will go, it doesn't go bad. We all know that it doesn't spoil. It never spoils, but it can darken over time and the flavor can change a little bit too, but mostly it's the color. And so I'm trying to use it up when in making some meads. And that's one of the reasons I'm making so much mead is to get work through that. And so I'm trying to go with things that are already darker in color anyway, because otherwise that dark honey, it almost looks like molasses is so dark now. Uh, it really changes the color. You know, if you're looking at something like the strawberry meat I made, it, it had a good flavor, but the color just looks a little off for being strawberry. So I'm looking at things that are darker in color, like the blueberries. And then the other thing I think I'm gonna try is throwing some vanilla beans into the mead and just do it that way just throw in some I, i'm actually going to split them down the center lengthwise and then put them in the ju jug with the honey water and fermentation starter mixture and then just let it go ahead and ferment with the vanilla beans right in there since it's already going to have a brownish color anyway uh, i think that would work just fine <laughs> with the vanilla beans and then that would also work well for making more vanilla extracts it's already gonna have some vanilla flavor in it and then I can use that and make an even stronger vanilla extract if I use that but I still when it comes to the vanilla extract I still prefer using this spiced rum for that everything all the other extracts I, I like to use my homemade wine and some honey mixed in with it 
but uh, the vanilla just the best flavor is with that spiced rum and I like to get it at Costco for the best price this is I talked about this in another this and that video and this is the infused oil I had started two months ago actually yeah just a little better than two months ago and this is specifically for my muscle rub and so i'm going to be redoing this video as well this video recipe because that other one is really old and this is going to be a little bit different than the one i did there i'm just really uh kind of up in my game on that so this is ready to strain and i'm hoping to get that video shot real soon oh and i wanted to mention too i set this here so i wouldn't forget if you're going to my store and you're one that's been enjoying buying our soaps i'm sorry i don't have any up right now i will i do plan on getting back into the soap making again i just it was one of the things i just had to cut for the time being because things had just been too crazy busy with the harvest and the collecting of the seeds and putting the seeds up on the store but anyway the soap making was one of the things that i had to stop this is the the last soap i have left and i don't even have it listed on the store and that was actually just by accident and i figured i'd leave it that way so it would remind me to get more made so i'm hoping that in about a month i can get started making the soaps again and i'm going to narrow down the amount of varieties i have too to just a few and that will also help keep me from getting too stressed out if I only have a few different ones to keep up on. But uh, then it'll still be, once I get started making them, it'll still be another month out before they're ready. And I'm still taking custom orders for skirts and aprons. And if I ever get time, I try to get a skirt put together or an apron to just put directly on the store. All right, well, that's a lot of information, like usual, to throw out at you. And if you can't absorb it all in one go then go ahead and listen to this video again because i know i talk fast that's just the way i am all right well thanks for watching take care and god bless